We're going to be at his home to many innovative artists, but one that caught our attention is James Cook, sculptor of the found object. started at the Sawdust, and I was developing this art form, people would walk in my booth and they'd go, you call this art? This is just junk. And I have to admit, in the beginning, I wasn't as sophisticated as I am now. Long before the concept of green was trendy and politically correct, James Cook was creating work from scraps of rusted metal and old discarded chunks of man-made objects. I take something that's going to be thrown away and make it beautiful. Let's say a saw blade is made to cut down trees, but I'll take that after its lifetime as a saw is used up and make it wings for a bird. James spends a portion of each year caring for his 94-year-old father Virgil in his hometown of New Oak, Wisconsin. We're going to Goodenich's General Store, and their motto is if we don't have it, you don't need it. It's a very small community, small town, about 82 people. There's absolutely nothing to do, so it's either weld or wither. Something happened when I went back to Wisconsin. Uh, it, I changed. Uh, my art got much better. I'm in my hometown. I'm in the house I was born and raised again, so maybe I get back into my very childlike quality of being a kid again, you know, and just making stuff. One day, I went out to the town dump, and I found this old dead spring, box spring. I somehow managed to get that box spring home with my little red wagon. I'm like seven or eight years old. And I have it in the front yard and I'm using it as a trampoline. I'm jumping up and down on it. And my father comes home and he goes, gosh darn it, Jimmy. I haul a load to the dump and it beats me home. I'm close to the source, you know, 45 minutes away from this um, scrapyard that I call the gold mine. I met James about 10 years ago in the scrapyard, and he come and was looking for different items, found objects, art, and he wanted to know if I could find any and save him any pieces. They pre-sort as saw blades come in, they put them in a pile or chains or ball bearings and hoops, metal hoops. My friend Tom, I told him I wanted every hoop he could lay his hands on, so about two weeks later he delivered 2,500 hoops. I have like a lifetime supply. A lot of my creative process happens right at the scrapyard. I'm seeing sculpture that you can push around the yard. I would find things at the scrapyard, and I traveled with a little uh, disposable camera. And I would lay them on the ground and take a picture. I knew what the piece was going to look like in my mind. But then, after I got it out to California in a crate, and I would look at it, and I'd go, I have no idea where I was going with this. So excited about finding more of this stuff. And one time I was moving pitchforks and I looked at them and I went, oh my god, they're rooster tails. Then all of a sudden I'm heating uh, the pitchforks up red hot and bending them and twisting them. And a wrench, a pitchfork, a rake for wings, a ball bearing for a head. And sometimes I go up to that scrapyard and I'll look and look and look and I can't find one single thing that will intrigue me or interest me. And other times I go up there. And I come home with a pickup load. I, you know, it's, the truck rides uphill all the way home. Today was an exceptionally good day as far as gathering stuff. Yeah, I wave my truck when I go into the scrapyard. And then after I've gone and searched and found my pieces of metal, I weigh when I go out. And every once in a while, they'll go, wow, not a very good day, huh? Okay, I have no idea what this is the byproduct of. But once a year, I find just a few pieces of this. And through the grace of God, I managed to weld it into a successful sculpture. A part of being a found object artist is, uh, is having the eye to spot the art in a pile of scrap, which is what I call myself, a found object artist. His ability to look at something that is everyday and, and perhaps somewhat forgettable. And he saw the beauty in that. I don't know what these were, but I see heron bodies. And make it something that would catch you off guard and make you laugh. 
or something that might draw you in and, and give you pause for contemplation? I think what captures you about Jane's work is that these are all found objects. And I probably trip across found objects every day of my life, but I don't see the artistic integral parts of it, and Jane's does. I find a really interesting piece of metal. I can be back in my backyard within 45 minutes working with it. It's going to be about, I'd say, seven or eight feet tall when I'm done. We got like two acres of mowed lawn, so I can lay projects out and kind of scope four or five things at the same time until one talks to me. And this is how I, I'll start to work. I'll just start laying pieces of iron out that are going to be incorporated in the sculpture, checking out the composition, building up layers. When I'm sculpting, I like a nice balance of um, geometric versus the organic. So maybe that's why I'm so in love with uh, gears, because there's machine made and they're, they're faceted and they're precise and then it plays against the real organic of the bent metal and the burnt metal. This stuff was made in the 30s. This stuff was made in the 40s. And all that material is no longer going to be available. I think it's part of the hydraulic system on a caterpillar cat, but it's got the nice resonance. Tone. So that's going to make a very nice shell. Hand-hammered iron has a life of its own because it's, it's the maker's life. It's like an original oil painting. Exactly. They have life of their own, even, even though yeah. they're ugly. And all they're not ugly. Well, I know, but some of them are. But because they're hand <laughs> I have yet to see an ugly piece of iron. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. I get goosebumps sometimes when I find an intriguing shape or piece of iron. He's impassioned about rocks and rust. Just the combination, the dichotomy of the stone with the texture of the rusted metal and the shapes he uses, he's very creative. So good natured and it's, uh, it's so reflective of, of, of his sensitivities and his sense of humor. I don't know where the ideas come from. I started last summer to make these little wire sculptures of horses and I started calling them Picorsos. These are one solid piece of wire. They start out on the left front foot and go up and down and around and around and then they end up on the right hind foot and it's one solid piece of wire. At, at any rate, Pablo Picasso um, did the same thing on, with pen and paper and I had no idea. My, my bucket of crunch chrome bumpers which I will make a guardian angel out of. His Catholic upbringing can be seen in the recurring shapes and symbols in his work obviously sunk way deep into my uh, my subconscious because it keeps bubbling out. Even when I, I think I'm trying to not do it, I do it. Like the California condor, if you look at that, it's very much, the arrangement is very much a cross. One of my favorite images I've come up with is a heart, and it's got like a, a twist of barbed wire on it. And I'm thinking like that whirlwind feel when you're first falling in love, that giddiness you have, and then, of course, because it's barbed wire wrapped around a heart, people equate it to the crown of thorns. So these are all bells. About a month before the festival opens, James ships the sculptures out to his home in Laguna Beach. That long journey requires thoughtful planning, packing, and the creation of a giant crate to ensure the safe arrival of his latest creations. Yes, this is going to be equivalent to Howard Carter opening up King Tut's tomb. 2,900 pounds of art. A little guardian angel. Is that going to be <laughs> fabulous? My six foot feather. We have them in six feet, five feet, and four feet. I ended up making this uh, almost life-size horse. This is probably the best thing I've done this year. Uh, man, the feathers might be the best thing I've done. <laughs> I need it right in the middle here. Okay. Next is set up time at the Sawdust, an annual adventure and not without its surprises. Yesterday was the initial inspection by the city and the city planner um, decided that I had way too much weight on my roof and my, built, my booth wasn't built to code even though I built it very, very sturdy. 
I got a phone call from the manager of the sawdust that I had to take all my art off my roof, and I just didn't want to do that. My very dear friend Steve stuck with me last night, and we worked till like 12, 30, 1 o'clock, reinforcing with 4x4s and earthquake straps. But we did it. We made it right. <laughs> Collectors look forward to the Sawdust Art Festival and a chance to add to their collections. Oh, I would look forward to seeing his work every summer at the Sawdust Festival. He was one of the few artists that I made a point to look for first and then see what else was uh, available. I always go to opening night and I always buy the best piece he has. <laughs> or I try to when he's 